Thank you for watching Queen Anne's County's first ever virtual community panel on drug prevention. Today you're going to hear from many special guests. And first up is Queen Anne's County Commissioner Jim Moran, who's going to tell you about all the things that Queen Anne's County is doing to fight the opioid crisis. My name is Jim Moran. I am the at-large county commissioner for Queen Anne's County. And I've been asked to pass along some information some, and educate you possibly on what Queen Anne's County is doing for the opioid crisis. And I'm going to first start with that. Uh, about five years ago, I got involved with the Drug Free Coalition, which is probably one of the strongest organizations in Queen Anne's County. So, you know, th that is a huge asset to Queen Anne's County. And, and thank God for my fellow commissioners. And we have funded uh, the Drug Free Coalition for the last four years. We've helped fund the uh, Haunted House, Haunted Trap House. Uh, we've, we've funded the signs that you see on the roadways telling you the opioid overdoses and the opioid deaths. And as I've said in the past, we don't want to ever see any of our citizens on that board. So that's what we're working towards. I will tell you also that Queen Anne's County is involved in multiple lawsuits against Big Pharma and some of the different opioid uh, painkillers and how they were marketed and how they were put out there to the public that caused a lot of this crisis that we are now in in uh, the United States. So we are actively in those lawsuits and hopefully there'll be some sort of uh, restitution to Queen Anne's County, which will in turn be used to help support education and um, addiction services for those that are afflicted with this disease. Uh, another thing that Queen Anne's County is involved in uh, on a government uh, aspect is the Queen Anne's County goes purple. Uh, if you notice, we have kickoffs every year. Our, our local fire departments support it. Our, our uh, government agencies support it. Our, if you notice the water towers, if you're ever driving around in September, you don't know, hey, why is that water tower purple? There it is. Queen Anne's County goes purple. Uh, I, I, I can't say enough about Dr. Kane and her commitment to this, um, the, the fighting of these uh, drug issues in Queen Anne's County and in our schools. Uh, she's been a blessing to us as far as allowing us to get in the schools uh, with the Chris Heron uh, programs that we had. Uh, we, we had uh, him speak at both high schools to our high school students and you know how uh, opioids had affected his life in hopes that uh, they don't affect your life. So you know these are just a couple of the things that are going on in Queen Anne's County. And, uh, you know, we've also have our, our, our um, substance abuse uh, coordinator at the school system now that uh, will, will helps in that aspect also for our kids. And, you know, in closing, I'd just like to say that anytime you feel the need that you need to talk to someone, please reach out. Please reach out to your, your family. If you don't feel comfortable talking to your family, your teachers, your coworkers, call us at the at county government, call us at our health department, call us at the Drug Free Coalition, call someone. We're there for you, and we're there for, for your health and well-being, and, and God bless you and what you do. Next up, we're going to hear from Queens County State's Attorney Lance Richardson to talk about the Good Samaritan Law. Today I'm going to talk a little bit about Maryland's Good Samaritan Law. This is found in the Annotated Code of Maryland, Criminal Procedure, Section 1210. The Good Samaritan Law came about five years ago as a result of the opioid epidemic that was killing young people all over the country. Maryland enacted this law basically to save lives. And the gist of the law is that if you do the right thing, if you call 911, if you seek medical assistance for someone who is in the midst of an overdose or alcohol poisoning, you will not be criminally prosecuted. Why did they enact this law? Well, obviously we want to prosecute drug possession, drug offenses, but human life is precious and that's why this law came into effect. I had a case where a woman was convicted of manslaughter because she was using drugs, specifically heroin, with a friend and then he was suffering a, an overdose, a medical emergency, and out of fear, of being charged criminally, she did not call 911. Ultimately, her friend died. She dumped his body in the parking lot of a church, and she was found guilty of manslaughter, which is a serious felony found in the murder statute. So the legislature said, 
we want people to do the right thing without fear of being arrested and charged in court. So um, unfortunately, in Queen Anne's County, we've had about 12 fatal overdoses a year for the last several years. And Narcan is the substance that saves these lives. All of our police, our EMTs, our medical professionals carry Narcan. And if you get to a person who is suffering an overdose in enough time and administer Narcan, you can save their life. And that is why uh, this law under criminal procedure is designed to save these lives. So um, medical assistance, even if you're on Route 301, someone's in the car, uh, overdosed on drugs, and you drive them to the Nesbitt Road Emergency Center, uh, that's a way of seeking medical assistance. If you go to the fire department, seek medical assistance, that will basically save the person from criminal prosecution. Uh, these overdoses happen every day. We're saving many lives by people calling 911, people who otherwise would not call because of fear of prosecution. Alcohol as well. The Good Samaritan law protects you from criminal prosecution for drugs or alcohol. And on co college campuses around the country, People die every year from alcohol poisoning. Young people who do 21 shots of alcohol for their 21st birthday, people don't realize that alcohol is deadly just like heroin and fentanyl. It's the number one killer of young people up to the age of 35. It used to be fatal car crashes, not anymore. Now it's alcohol and fentanyl. Um, so if you're in this situation, please call 911. Get medical attention for someone who's in an overdose crisis. And um, if you do the right thing, you do not have to fear being charged criminally. Um, that's what life is precious. And that's what we want the word to go out to our community uh, to get help for someone. Um, you know, don't worry about uh, what's going to happen with the police or anything else. Don't think that somebody can just sleep it off if they're severely intoxicated. That person very well may never wake up. Um, call 911, get them help, and hopefully they're gonna be fine. But you're gonna be fine as well. I'm gonna take that into consideration that you did the right thing, and um, you will not have to suffer the consequences in court. So that is Maryland's Good Samaritan Law. Thank you for listening. We couldn't let this event happen without speaking to Sheriff Gary Hoffman. So here he is to talk about all the things that his department is doing to help the community. Hi, I'm Sheriff Gary Hoffman. And yet another year has passed and Queen Anne's County, like our country and our nation, still suffers from an opioid epidemic. In Queen Anne's County at the time that this is taped, there were three overdoses and two deaths. And here we are in early February. The big question comes up is what is Queen Anne's County Office of the Sheriff and its partners doing to assist with this opioid epidemic? Everyone knows that we do the drug take back days. We partner with our schools, our churches and our civic organizations to make sure that we have a clear message out there that if you have a substance abuse problem, we are here to help. There are many resources out there. The person who has the opioid addiction has to want to help. And it takes a family and a community to get this person through this substance abuse issue. Together as a county, as a sheriff's office, and as a big community, we're here to support someone who has this opioid addiction. But I can send a very clear message, and we've demonstrated that in the past, and we're gonna do it again. If you're a dealer or you're selling to somebody within our community, I can promise you one thing. Queen Anne's County Office of the Sheriff its partners with the Queen Anne's County Drug Task Force and other allied agencies are going to come knocking at your door. We have a zero tolerance in Queen Anne's County for anyone selling, distributing, or giving any type of illegal substance to somebody. And if you cause a death, I can promise you one thing. Our partnership with the state's attorney, we are going to hunt you down and we are going to make an arrest. We're going to do everything we can. And even if you sell to somebody in Queen Anne's County and you're from outside of our area, I can promise you, we're going to come find you there too. If you have an issue, please contact somebody. Use one of the many resources. We are here to help as a community. Look, it's an addiction and it's something that you can overcome. 
With family support and community, it's something that we can all get through together. Let's keep Queen Anne's County the great safe place that it is, and please reach out for help. Now we're going to visit with the Queen Anne's County Detention Center and Lamont Cook to hear what's going on at the detention center during these rough times. I'm Warden Lamont Cook. I've been with the county operating its uh, Department of Corrections uh, since 1987. I've seen a lot in these many years. And I know that um, many times when we look at the criminal justice process, the courts, the police departments, sheriff departments, the prosecutor, uh, we tend to not think about what goes on once all those processes have taken place and what happens to these individuals once they become incarcerated. Here we have had to deal with that uh, and balancing that out with the COVID situation, uh, it's been quite a task to keep up with all of this. When I first started in criminal justice many years ago, we did not have the uh, intense involvement with uh, the drugs and, and opioids as we do today. And one of the things that uh, we find that even though these individuals are incarcerated with us for whatever period of time, we still have to deal with their problems. They still have to be treated. They still come in here with, with, with issues. Uh, we even have problems with them attempting to get these substances into the facility. So we have to monitor all of these things. We do have individuals that relapse. They have uh, uh, issues when they can't adjust to being in an enclosed environment. We've had to deal with individuals who have come in and they have overdosed. We've had to treat that. We've had to take some to the hospital. Uh, it's kind of an uh, unusual situation when you look at the opioid uh, thing, when you look at the streets and what's going on there and what happens once these individuals are incarcerated. All of the 23 counties in this state are dealing with that situation trying to manage these individuals, especially those with co-occurring disorders. Uh, when I talk about co-occurring disorders, we're talking about individuals who have uh, mental health problems and behavioral problems because of the drugs and opioids that they use. So it's, it's really a balancing act that we face, especially in small facilities like mine. How do we treat these individuals and get them ready to go back out on the streets? There are limited programs here we do work with the courts to see that these individuals may get into a treatment facility, but those beds are pretty rare, and sometimes they're here uh, months at a time before there's something available for them to go to. And other times, uh, depending on the situation, we release them back out into the community. We do try to find some community resources for them, but a fair amount of times they go right back out into the community and face the same challenges that they did, which put them back in here uh, and, and being incarcerated like they have been. So, you know, it's a, it's a struggle f at times for us, the officers here and the staff, to treat these individuals. We do have a medical program here. We do have a mental health program here that we try to help these individuals with. We've had some successes as well as failures. So, you know, this is a situation where we need to work together, all branches of criminal justice, the courts, the police, the sheriff's department, and other resources that we have out here, the health department, to try to balance out these situations and get these people the help that they need. But unfortunately, those, those services and, and resources are not enough to deal f out here for everyone. So I just wanted folks to be aware that we do see this here at the detention center. It's going on in the prisons. We do meet regularly, and when I say we, the criminal justice people that are involved in corrections. We do deal with trying to find solutions as a group and as individuals. So, you know, this is gonna be ongoing. Uh, we just have to figure out how we minimize the issues that, that occur with these individuals that are incarcerated. So hopefully, you know, we can come together and work on these things and, uh, you know, make the community better. Thank you for watching so far. Next up, we have a very special guest. It's Sean Gleason, and he's here to share his very personal story. Hi, my name's Sean Gleason, and I'm an addict. I was asked to come here today. First, I'd first of all, I'd like to thank Lance, uh, Sheriff Hoffman, Kathy Wright, and other members of the uh, Drug Free Coalition that have asked me to come and share my experience, strength, and hope. 
Um, I always like to start off by first thanking God for another day clean, another day alive. It is truly only through God's grace and mercy that I'm able to come here today clean, alive, and in my right mind and able to carry any kind of message. Um, this is a little different for me, speaking to a camera as opposed to people, so just bear with me and, and um, I'm going to try and share a little bit of my story, where I've been, where I'm at now, and my hope for the future. Um, I was born on Canal, I'm a lifelong resident. I was uh, born and raised in Malling Farms, a neighborhood on Canal Island. And I grew up in a relatively normal household. Uh, my parents taught me morals, values, instilled in me all the things that teach you right from wrong. Um, I was raised in a household with a, I was raised in a Catholic faith. Um, so at some point I was beginning to hang around people that were older than I was. Uh, I have older siblings. And back then, we're talking about, it was quite a while ago, the 1970s, it was a little bit different outlook on the way things were approached as far as children and being around uh, things of substances and natures, alcohol, things like, like that. It was semi-acceptable for a young uh, boy like myself to go get my father a beer, things, really simple things that didn't seem like a big deal at the time. Um, I don't think anybody would have foreseen what I ended up going through um, because I thought that that was acceptable behavior Everybody around me did that on a normal basis, so I thought that that was just the progression of things. I did end up starting a little bit earlier than most people or children would. I started, um, I think I took my first drink at around 10 or 11 years old, and I honestly believe that I was born with, the, uh, with addiction, with the genetic predisposition for obsessive and compulsive behavior, which led to um, one, the first time I tried a substance, it just continued to progress to the point where I was given the gift of desperation um, that I feel like by God to finally seek recovery from what I was suffering from. Um, I'm gonna try and condense this. They've asked me to try and shorten it to about 15 minutes, which is a little difficult. There's a, a long time span in between. What I can say is that through all the trials and tribulations that, uh, that I went through with drug addiction, um, I was incarcerated multiple times, uh, multiple arrests. I was incapable of having any type of social acceptability, responsibility. Um, I was not a contributing member of society. And um, for me, it seemed like I would thought that there was something wrong with me. Um, and basically what I ended up finding out through the course of entering the, um, the process of recovery is that I don't have a moral deficiency. Um, I don't have a mental issue. It's a mental illness issue. It's basically a spiritual malady from which I suffer. And that it was a relief to know that all I needed to do was arrest my disease and I was able to move, move forward and change my life completely. Um, I don't like to focus on the years of, of using that I, that I went through. Um, I can tell you for qualification purposes that uh, I was arrested multiple times for DUIs. Um, I ended up um, using several what you would consider hard narcotics for a extended long periods of time, years, and um, which ended up taking me to a place where no one ever thought, including myself, that I would ever end up. Um, I. Uh, it's hard for me to try and explain because I feel like um, this is a public forum as opposed to uh, anonymous meetings where, that I normally attend. So I'm trying to semi-curtail my experience, strength, and hope. But <clears throat> I can tell you that for me, um, the disease of addiction completely and utterly destroyed my life. Um, every relationship that I ever had, it made me incapable of functioning in a normal society, and I had no idea how to go about changing that. Like I said, I thought that there was something wrong with me, that I, was, that I had a defect of character that was gonna cause me to continue to just go through this cycle of using, being arrested, being incarcerated, getting out and starting this whole process over. And I did that for many years. Um, <clears throat> I was introduced for the first time to a recovery fellowship in 2003. Um, so when I got there, I had no idea what recovery was about. All I knew was that I could not continue to live the way I was living one more day. Um, I went in, I was, um, basically what it boils down to for me was that I had to, for the first time in my life, follow directions, 
take some simple suggestions and uh, come to a, um, a basic understanding and acceptance of what that I had been going through that someone else had to identify for me because I wasn't sure exactly what it was that I was um, suffering from. Um, sometimes we get trapped in the illusion of a what if, if only, and just one more time to the point where I thought that there was something out there that I was seeking all the time. Um, and basically what it boiled down to for me was it was a spiritual malady I was suffering from, a feeling inside of me. And this is why, the, because there is a, uh, there's a school of thought and argument of disease or choice, disease or choice. I like to separate the word dis-ease. It's the dis-ease, the, un, the restlessness of my spirit, that uneasy feeling inside me. It's like a gnawing inside that um, I always look for something to fill that with. And when I introduced a substance, it seemed like the answer, and it led to years and years of pain, suffering, dereliction, and uh, I, what I feel like now was unnecessary pain. Um, I can say for whatever reason, I feel like I've been given God's grace in perpetuity. Um, and maybe today is the reason why I went through some of the things that I had to go through. Um, I just hoped, I prayed on the way up here and I asked that if for no other reason that I came here today, that if I can reach anybody that is suffering anywhere near to the extent that I was, um, I just want to tell you there's hope. There's tons of people out there that are uh, willing and waiting for people to um, reach out and, you know, become willing to try and change their life. Um, the process of recovery is one that basically consists of three things that we consider indisp indispensable, which are honesty, open-mindedness, and willingness. First, we have to become honest with ourselves, um, admit that there's a major uh, problem, and then become honest with another human being and tell them that I need help. Um, and if a strange thing happens when you ask for help, a lot of times you get it. Um, I was unaware of that. I was extremely, I had uh, self-centered fear so bad that, that held me back for years um, that I, I feel honestly that I went through a lot of unnecessary suffering if I would have just probably raised my hand and said, hey, I'm going through this, I probably, you know, the outcome could have been different or a shorter period of time. Um, I'm not sure how to explain the transformation that my life's gone through since I decided to enter the process of recovery. Um, I, I belong to a fellowship that we believe in complete abstinence from all um, mind-changing, mood-altering substances. Um, and in that process, once you have that, what you get is a daily reprieve from, from uh, the suffering. We focus on the root cause of the spiritual malady. Um, there are some, some steps that are necessary. I can tell you that for this addict, I would have walked 20 miles to get one more, and all they're asking me to do is take 12 easy steps. Um, it's In comparison, it's... Uh, not, not that tall of an order. Um, some of the people that are on this board I actually know from different areas of my life. Of uh, Lance is an old friend of mine, and uh, know him from his professional side as well. Um, familiar with uh, Warden Cook. I was there several times through my addiction at the detention center. Um, Kathy Wright is a friend of mine, and again, I'd, I'd just like to thank everyone for stepping out on faith and asking uh, an addict to come up and share their experience, strength, and hopes, which shows that the county is willing to start moving in the direction of help and not, because for a long time this has been considered a, a crime or a, a moral deficiency, and when that, what that does is drive an addict farther into isolation. Um, we need to open our arms and open our doors to the people that are in our community that are suffering from this. It's, I believe the treatment is the only way to move away from what we have now, which seems to be a, uh, I mean, locally an epidemic, um, and which is seems to be you know nationwide. There are people that are available around the clock. Um, there are 1-800 numbers that are available that you can call if you have uh, that if yourself or a family member is suffering. Um, I'm sure if you contacted the coalition, those numbers are available. Um, I just wanted to uh, point out that. In, in this area, where it's called considered the east of the Bay Area. There are a lot of meetings available. 
there are tons of uh, information. Uh, the health department is not a bad place to, to go. Um, I just, you know, I can't express enough the, the, great, the, the gratitude that I have for being asked to come here today. Um, that, you know, God has shown fit to show me grace and mercy to get me to a point where I was even considered to come up here. Um, that's only due to the process of recovery, I can tell you that. Um, it wasn't that long ago um, that no one really wanted to hear what I had to say. Uh, <laughs> this is a, a life-transforming process. Um, I, I, you know, I can only speak for myself. I know that for me, I went from being in the tr front seat of my truck with not enough gas money to get to the top of the bridge to jump because I was afraid I'd run out and have to get out and run, and it was pouring down rain, so I was sitting in my truck, destitute, phone cut off, nowhere to go. Um, not, I didn't feel like I had a friend in the world to call, and within a short period of time, I have my family back together. We're all under one roof. Um, we have a home. Um, I have a career. And basically, I feel that the only thing that I left to do, that I have left to do, is pay back something that has been so graciously given to me. And that's uh, to help another addict that may be still suffering. I, I just want you to know, if you're a family member, there are places for you to go if you have a loved one that's suffering. If you're an addict and you see my face right now, please reach out. Um, there are people here that are willing to help. Um, most addicts will get in the car and go wherever you are or, and do whatever you need to do to try and get you into uh, a place where you're safe. I just want you to know that in the east of the Bay Area, you have a safe place to land. You can't come in and tell us anything that's going on with you that one of us has not either either been through, going through, or just got through. So basically what I'm asking you to do is um, take, take a leap of faith, um, give yourself a break, reach out, find the resources that are necessary in our community, and hopefully I'll see you soon and uh, we can start the process for you as well. Thank you. Last but not least, we're going to hear from the Drug Free Coalition, and we can't hear from them without talking to Warren Wright. Hi, everybody. I'm Warren Wright, and uh, I'm a proud member of the Queen Anne's County Drug Free Coalition. We've been at this for about 21 years. We have about 150 members, but we still have four original members. Um, our mission is a one-sentence statement that we've used for 20 years, and that is we want to reduce the incidence and the amount of drug, alcohol, and tobacco use by Queen Anne's County youth and young adults. Um, we have um, used that for all of this time. And when we started, our biggest accomplishment was getting the trust of all the public agencies in the county. Uh, we started with the Board of Education and the Sheriff. The Sheriff, by the way, was one of the original members. Uh, we worked with them and with the Health Department. Uh, after that, the Board of Education came in because I worked there. Uh, and as time went on, we found that if we were trustworthy and gave correct information, didn't go there to find flaws, but went there to help, then the other public organizations in the, in the community came in, like emergency services, uh, uh, the defend the Lance and the public and the uh, district attorney's office. All of those public institutions are now part of the DFC. After that, now of course, well, you can't be successful unless you get, of course, Channel 7 on board, but we got them in our pocket. Now, as time went on, we also looked to public, public clubs, civic groups for money, and also to help them with their activities. We've done that, and they've sponsored many of those things. Um, as a matter of fact, when it comes to money, uh, our last project was quite expensive and our budget was $75,000. Where'd that come from? Well, it came from grants, it came from individuals, it came from uh, members of the DFC and community civic organizations. What kind of things are we doing? We're doing, uh, you might remember the Haunted Trap House, you might remember QAC Goes Purple, you might remember the five uh, town hall meetings that we've had, you might remember the basketball player. Uh, who came in, he was $20,000. You might remember Ray Lozano, the great speaker. He was paid for by the Elks Lodge. If you were interested in the DFC, it's real hard. 
you just send an email to qacdfc at gmail.com. Am I going to call you? No. But you'll be aware then of the kinds of things that we do. And there might be something that you can help us with or we can help you with. Thanks very much. Thank you so much for joining us for the virtual panel. If you need any help, please ask for help. Reach out through any of the avenues that you saw in this video. Thanks for watching. Mm -hmm.